Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for join on, joining us. I'll get it right in a minute. Joining us for today's edition of Brown Bag Beat Bites. We're going to be discussing handling condominium association insurance issues in the COVID-19 era from the basics to pandemic planning. For those of you who don't know, my name is Stacia Miller. I'm one of the attorneys in Zomietsky, Danner, and Fiorito's Mount Clemens offices. On name, so bear with me on everybody here. We've got uh, Scott Mac McNerney. Did I do it right, Scott? Yes, that's correct. Good job. All right, look at me go. <laughs> uh, Scott is, like I said, with Sterling Insurance Company. He is an outsourced risk manager and producer with Sterling Insurance. He's a certified insurance counselor with 19 years of experience specializing in insuring condominium associations, homeowners associations, condo owners, contractors, manufacturers, distributors, and everybody else on the planet. If you need insurance, Scott can cover you. Joining our other special guest today is Josh Martin. Did I say that one right? Because I was really worried about that one, Josh. You got it. Got it? Perfect. Okay. All right. Two for two. I'm going to get yours wrong, boss man. Josh yeah, is a personal okay. line sales executive. Yeah, I know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get yours wrong. Josh is a personal line sales executive with Sterling Insurance Group with over nine years of experience in the uh, insurance industry, protecting what matters most to his clients while exceeding client expectations with great rates and professionalism. And we would like to welcome them both. Along with them, we have our illustrious leader, partner, Gregory J. F F F Fiorito, right? Did I get that one right? Yeah, that's, you got it. <laughs> I'm not fired today. Uh, Greg specializes, of course, in handling your complex legal issues that affect your homeowners uh, associations and condo associations, including your document amendment projects, rental caps, insurance issues, fair housing, compliance and putting out every little fire that you could possibly find for your uh, neighbors and friends to light. Um, I will be on Facebook and I will uh, host that as I usually do. As you come up with questions, if you've joined us on Facebook, please throw them into the chat and I will ask our wonderful presenters to answer those questions as they come up. Without further ado, Ms. Melissa Francis, enjoy the presentation. Good afternoon. I am going to be moderating here on Zoom. So if you are watching us on Zoom, um, the chat box is open. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat box and I will ask some of our presenters um, if you can make sure that your video is off. Um, I do have everyone muted um, except for our presenters. So um, please don't try to unmute yourself. Um, we just want to make sure that we're keeping um, this open. If you need to ask a question, um, you can message me and then I can um, unmute you if um, you need to do it that way. But um, I prefer that if you have a question, please drop it in the chat and then I will ask it of our presenters. So without further ado, we can start our presentation. Thank you, uh, Stacia and Melissa, for that wonderful introduction and for getting my name right. Um, let's dive into it. Today we have uh, Scott and Josh from Sterling Insurance Group, and we're going to talk about insurance for associations. Uh, it can seem like a complex and unwieldy topic, but we're going to break it down for you today, tell you what you need to know as a member of a board, uh, as well as an owner, uh, to protect yourself with insurance in the HOA and condo context. So let's go to our first slide here. We have our insurance choo-choo. Uh, thank you very much, Melissa, for finding that uh, wonderful, wonderful template um, for our presentation. But um, here is the illustration of, these are the types of coverages you have to think about uh, as an association, as a board member. Um, of course, at the head of the train, we have general liability. You wanna protect yourself generally from all liability, claims that can be brought. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit today about something a little more uh, of a niche topic, a hot topic, cyber coverage and social engineering. Uh, we're going to talk about that today. Property coverage, another big one that you have to have, uh, especially as a condominium. Uh, directors and officers to protect your volunteer directors and officers. 
uh, employee dishonesty, or what they call fidelity or bonds or, or crime coverage. And then workers' compensation, we'll talk a little bit about that as that can be uh, subject to question sometimes whether you need to have it, if you don't have employees, do you need it if you don't have any employees. So these are the types of insurance that we're gonna talk about today which come into play uh, for most associations. We can move to the next slide. We'll look at some of the uh, basics of the law on this. And there re it really isn't a whole lot as far as what does the law require you to carry? And it's you know not surprising as with a lot of things in the Condominium Act, it's kind of what your documents provide. But you know you have to have some insurance. So what does the Condominium Act says? It says that the co-owners have to uh, protect themselves from risk of affecting the condominium project. Um, very basic, extremely basic, but that's got to be in your bylaws. And, that, and that's all you get from the Condo Act. Um, there is something called the Michigan Administrative Code, which also addresses insurance and other topics. There is a whole section of regulations, which many people are not even aware of, for condominiums. And one of them talks about insurance and just says, yes, you should have insurance. You should have what they call extended coverage, or what is also known as all-risk coverage or special, special form coverage these days. Uh, but to cover all risks that are going to affect your project, um, and the, the premiums are the cost of the premiums are expenses of administration that everybody shares within the association. But that's all. Again, that's all it says. You should have this type of insurance. It also mentions liability, workers' disability, and some other types. But very basic. Not going to give you a whole lot of guidance. Nonprofit Act has the same thing, um, but a very specific type of insurance that the Nonprofit Act talks about is DNO. And it says a corporation may purchase insurance. So, you know, DNO to me is, you know, I don't know what Scott and Josh think, but DNO to me, it's got to be mandatory. I mean, you got to have that to protect your directors and officers. And that's why I do amendments. I put in the word shall instead of the word may. Yeah, I agree, Greg. That's very yeah. important uh, to the board members that it's one of the top pieces of the insurance program that they should really look at, look at and uh, make sure they're getting a uh, policy that's going to cover them for, uh, personally as well. Yeah, you don't want to have personal liability as a board member. You know, you're not getting paid to do that, probably, or, you know, at least that people know of. Uh, but you're not getting paid, you're a volunteer. And uh, why would you, why the heck would you take any kind of individual liability um, on for doing that? I mean, nobody would do it if they thought they could be sued. Um, so it's so important to have that DNO. Uh, but, you know, my general point here is review your documents, have somebody look at your documents. Um, what do they say about insurance? You know, not, not all documents are created equal. Um, some of these coverages might not even be mentioned. Um, and, you know, different types of insurance, um, which I'll get into a little bit later with property, um, it might not be correct. So I always recommend that associations, if you're going to look at your documents or look at amending your documents, look at the insurance provisions. Even if you're not amending, just look at them as a board of directors or as a co-owner and give them to your insurance agent. Have them look at them and make sure that you're protected. Next slide. All right, so let's talk a little bit about property insurance for, for a condominium. Uh, what are the types of insurance you could have? Well, basically there's three levels of coverage. Uh, you start with what's the least amount of coverage the association could carry, which is called the bare walls, and just insures like the shell, right? The structure of the building uh, does not insure any standard uh, equipment fixtures or trim inside the unit, like carpet, cabinets, uh, wood trim, things like that, you know, in a bare wall scenario, co-owners got to insure that. Um, so bare walls is like the barest minimum that uh, association can get for property coverage. Uh, then you move up to what 95% of or more of condo uh, associations have in Michigan, which is called single entity coverage. Single entity coverage, all that means is that the association insures as a single entity, the general common elements plus the standard fixtures, equipment, and trim that came furnished with the unit from the developer. So the, the idea is if the place burns down, the unit burns down, uh, you're going to have all the money you need to put that unit back to where it was standard grade when it was purchased from the developer. And the third thing, uh, third level of coverage is all in. Okay, all in coverage is single entity plus the upgrades, betterments, and improvements that either the developer or a co-owner put into their unit. So you've got you know, super duper uh, you know, granite countertops that you upgraded. Um, normally in a single entity scenario, the co-owner is responsible to make sure you ensure that upgrade. But if you go all in, if the association goes all in, 
um, then the association would be covering those upgrades. But again, single entity is what the vast majority of uh, insurance companies have in Michigan. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on, on that type of thing, Scott or Josh, as far as you know, the importance of carrying single entity or any of these other issues. Yeah, Greg, you're, you're correct. Um, basically, it's going to depend on their bylaws. We always look at a copy of those to see what the requirements are. But yeah, typically, we're writing the single entity type of policy. Um, the bare walls is going to restrict you to the, the certain coverage. And the all-in um, will require there to be insurable interest. Now, if the, the co-owners of the units are putting the improvements and betterments in there, I'm sure they have coverage on their own uh, HO6 policy. And the, the an association probably doesn't even have any insurable interest in, in their upgrades. So it all depends on the bylaws, but yeah, we're, we're like you said, 95 plus percent of the time, if not 100% of the time, we're writing the single entity coverage. Yeah, I totally, I totally re, uh, agree with you and would reiterate, look at your bylaws. It's so important, especially for insurance. Like the insurance guys are going to look at your bylaws, right? And say, what are we supposed to cover? Um, so if you have a question about what is supposed to be covered, look at your bylaws. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is, you know, the age old question of we want to save money. We're tired of, as an association of covering all these water losses. You know, should we switch to bare laws? Let, let's, let's, let's switch to bare walls. Let's switch so that we're not insuring everything inside as far as the trim and carpeting and cabinets. So we don't have to worry about these, all these water losses we're having. Is that a good idea? And some attorneys push that pretty strongly and say, yes, you should, as an association, switch to bare walls because you're gonna save money. You're gonna save money on the premium. Um, but to me, I think you really gotta weigh all the pros and cons. It's not just about saving money on your premium. Um, might you save money on that? You might save, I guess, some on the premiums. Um, Scott and Josh can, can talk a little bit about that, but um, there's also cons to it. If you're gonna have the co-owner insuring all the trim that came with the unit inside, and there's a loss, you're gonna be working with you know, two different insurance companies, uh, two different contractors. And so it's gonna be a lot more complicated. You know, and that's assuming the co-owner has that coverage for their interior items. What if they don't, okay? If the co-owner doesn't have that coverage, you might end up with a, with a shell of a unit that you can't rebuild because you don't have the money because the co-owner was responsible in that bare wall scenario to ensure all their carpeting, all their cabinets, all their trim, and they didn't do it. And, not, and on top of that, they might not be collectible. They don't have any money. So what are you going to do? Is it worth your savings to, as an association to switch to bare walls uh, when you get into you know, a scenario down the line with a loss that you can't, you can't rebuild the unit and then you got to end up in litigation with the co-owner fight over it. So um, my thought on it is you know, it's not a be all end all to switch to bare walls. You, you might want to do it if, you're, if it makes sense for your community, you have a lot of, a lot of losses, you want to reduce the claims on your policy that you're filing for those, but uh, I think you really got to think about it. Scott, I don't know if you have something to add on, on the premium. Yeah, I, I, recommend, yeah I, I don't recommend going to the bare wall coverage. Like you said, it could be um, very difficult, confusing and time consuming to do so. Um, and, and really, there's not going to be much of a premium difference, if any, because that's only going to, the premium may be a little bit lower, but that's only on the property side of it. A lot of the, the premium comes from the general liability as well. So, and, 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 you know, at the end of the day, you don't have to go through the struggle of dealing, like you said, with a couple different insurance companies and contractors. Uh, and we'd like to eliminate that gray area and just go with uh, the single entity coverage. And you know, you're going to have some uh, coverage to respond for you. Next slide, please. So this is another big hot topic, deductibles. Let's say the association has a loss and they're carrying a $5,000 deductible um, and the association files a claim. Okay, the loss gets repaired, the unit gets repaired, but now you got this $5,000 and the board of directors comes to me and says, hey, um, why do we have to pay this $5,000 deductible when Susie Smith, you know, it was her uh, appliance that exploded and caused the fire in her unit. We want to assess Susie Smith the $5,000 on our the policy on our deductible. Can we do this? Well, it depends on what your documents say. Um, generally, the association, if it has a duty to insure and you carry a deductible, as an association, you're choosing to self-insure to the extent of that deductible amount. So you, bet, you better make sure you have money on hand 
to pay that deductible amount as an association. Now, if you put things in your documents that allow you to assess the deductible to the co-owner in certain situations, then yes, you could assess the deductible to the co-owner depending on the facts of the situation. Uh, the most common thing you'll see is the ability to assess the deductible if the co-owner was negligent. Um, but that could be problematic, you know, trying to prove negligence, you know, whether, um, you know, if an appliance explodes, the co-owner might not have been negligent at all. Um, the appliance just failed, it just, you know, it just leaked, it just happens. Um, so it's hard to prove negligence sometimes. So, you know, there's other standards you can use in your documents to allocate deductibles. You could go with where the origin of the loss occurred. And just, you know, that's more of a strict liability standard, like if the appliance was in your unit and it failed, you're responsible for that deductible. Um, another way to do it is just if you have multiple units that are damaged, you, you allocate the deductible based on the size of the loss to each unit. So if it's, you know, 10% of the loss, of, you know, the damages were in one unit and 90% in the other, then you split the deductible 10%, 90% between those two units. So, you know, there's no perfect system for doing it. They all have their pros and cons again, but it's about what you want and make sure it's in your documents. If you don't have it and you try to assess somebody for the deductible, they're gonna be able to challenge that. Um, go ahead. Uh, from a deductible standpoint, I always like to give different options. Um, in your scenario with the, the appliance uh, blowing up, the association's insurance carrier is gonna respond for them and they might have to subrogate against the, the co-owners um, uh, HO6 homeowners policy to, if they determine that they're at fault. And who knows, maybe they had a, a contractor and they're hooking, a plumber hooking up the, uh, the appliance and they're at fault. So then, then who's really, uh, which policy is really going to respond? Is it gonna be the HO6 policy, the association policy or the general liability policy from the contractor? Um, that, so it, either way it's, the association's policy should respond for them, but then there'd be some subrogation after that to see to determine if there's going you know, if the association's policy is going to get um, some money paid back to them. Yeah, and on the subrogation, the one thing I would add to the in the association's context is often the documents will prevent subrogation between the association and the co-owner um, because they don't want. I guess the idea is they don't want um, you know if a co-owner if if the the policy pays out a loss to repair co-owner's unit. The co-owner doesn't want to have to worry about being sued by the association's insurer on a subrogation claim. So your documents might prohibit that, but I've seen subrogation work with a third party contractor where one person had Lowe's come in and install a refrigerator <laughs> in their unit. And that refrigerator leaked to cause all kinds of damage. And uh, I think the association's insurer in that respect, in that case was able to subrogate and go after Lowe's because they weren't protected by the subrogation clause in the bylaws, it was a third party. So subrogation could come into play. Um, but that's again, like you said, it's between the insurers themselves mm -hmm. and you know, they'll fight with each other if there is a subrogation to try to get reimbursed. And you know, as a co-owner or the association, you're kind of hopefully out of it at that point. Um, next slide, please. All right, this is our fun slide. This is, um, you know, Star Trek. Um, why would we need DNO insurance? Damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not an HOA expert. And I say this, you know, every day. Well, I usually say I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I don't know how, to, something like that. I you know, say that often. Anyway, next slide. Um, DNO, okay, it's, as we said at the beginning, very important. Um, now listed on this slide are just a few of the coverages that uh, you should have as part of the policy. Um, and I don't know if, if Scott, if you want to speak a little bit about some of those coverages, you want to make sure that they have. Certainly, I mentioned it earlier that the, the DNO policy protects the board members for decisions they make. It, they can get sued personally for their performance. And it kind of acts like an errors and omissions policy for those board members. So um, if, if you, maybe uh, determine you want to put up a, a, so a piece of playground equipment, a sign, um, maybe you don't adhere to the bylaws, uh, there's defamation of another member, something of that nature, or even an improper removal of another board member. It could come back uh, as a, uh, a situation where there's a lawsuit uh, directed toward the current board member. So the DNO policy is going to cover you for that. A couple things that you're going to want to pay attention to are the uh, one, 
specifically is the retroactive date. Uh, ideally, we like to get full priors acts coverage. If the carrier doesn't offer that, we get we have to make sure that any new program is going to have the same exact retroactive date as a current program. Otherwise, you're going to be um, basically lose coverage for anything prior to that if, if you don't have a retroactive date that extends back to the current one or the, the, the time that the, the association was established. Um, the other things that you're going to want to look at is spousal extensions, which is going to cover a spouse of a board member in case they try to sue them personally. And um, this policy is going to have the duty to defend the board members. So it's very important for any type of uh, association that has a board members and executives to get uh, this policy enforced. Yeah, and I'd add to that, um, make sure you have uh, coverage for non-monetary or breach of contract claims. Um, you know, somebody sues the board because let's say, you know, going to the COVID-19 example, you decided not to open your pool. And somebody says, I have a right to use that pool and you're supposed to maintain it as a board. I'm gonna sue you for deciding not to open it. So you're not, you're not asking for any money damages as a co-owner, but you're saying, I'm challenging that decision and I'm gonna sue you to, to undo that decision. That's what you call a, a non-monetary claim. And, and I think you wanna make sure that that's definitely not excluded uh, from your policy, from your DNO, correct? Yeah, and, and you know, the, the policy is gonna be there to defend the board members. Uh, and even if, like I said, there's no damages per se awarded, there's still gonna be defense costs. Yeah, and that's so important. The defense costs, even if there's no damages, you gotta have that defense coverage. Um, you know, a lot of times you have these indemnification provisions in your bylaws and stuff, and it's all, it's all well and good if you got them in there, but really your insurance is going to be what protects you. You know, if you get sued as a board member, you're not going to say, give me indemnification association. The association is not going to want to cut you a check for hundred thousand dollars out of its own pocket. Right? So you got to make sure you have the DNO. That's your first line of defense. No matter what your bylaws say, you got to make sure you have good coverage, you know, review your coverage with your insurance agents. Um, and, um, make sure you have uh, good coverage with, without a lot, of, a lot of exclusions. And we have a question, I guess, in the chat. Uh, Scott, could you talk a little bit more about that uh, spousal, spousal extension? Yeah, so as I mentioned, the, the, the DNO policy protects the, the board members personally. So if they get sued, they can go after their personal assets, which would include the spousal extension. And even though the spouses might not be making the decisions, they, they are protected if they get the their husband or and or wife get sued for one of the decisions that the board does make. I think they're going to, and I think they would try to sue both of them, yeah. you know, because in order to get to the assets, right. If they're jointly held. Exactly. Um, they're going to have, otherwise to they just put it in the other spouse's name and they, right. they, they don't have to worry. So um, yeah. we talked the other day about the general liabilities policy for a company extends to the employees and, and uh, the X they do, if they injure somebody on premises, it's, the, the company's general liability policy is going to extend to cover the employees for their operations. It's kind of similar to that. So thank you for that question and that answer. Um, one thing, other, last thing I want to mention on this slide is, you know, the whole COVID thing. Um, if, you know, a DNO requires a wrongful act to trigger uh, coverage, but in uh, the COVID scenario, you know, there's an exclusion in your DNO for what they call bodily injury. So COVID-19, somebody contracts it at the pool is arguably that's a bodily injury. Um, so you're not going to have coverage under your DNO for a COVID-related claim for like reopening the pool, that decision to reopen. It's going to be excluded most likely. You're going to have to look at your other types of coverage to see if you have anything, right, Scott? I mean, and yeah, bodily, yep, a bodily injury claim would, would uh, something that the general liability is, is designed for. Uh, it's hard in this situation uh, because we don't know if they did contract COVID at a certain point. You can't really pinpoint where they contracted it at. They could have got it at a sporting event, at work themselves or at a supermarket. But the, yeah, the, the DNO policy uh, is more for the wrongful act uh, than you know, compared to the bodily injury. Okay, well, let's move on then and talk about a next type of coverage. Another very important coverage for all boards to have employee dishonesty insurance, uh, what they also I think is called crime coverage or also known as fidelity bonds, fidelity insurance. Um, you know, if you have a board member that steals money uh, or a property manager steals money from the board, from the association, and, and, they're do and this happens a lot. I mean, 
a lot more than you think it happens. I've seen it happen with some of our own clients. And it's just so unbelievable when you see this happen. It's like, they can't believe that so-and-so was stealing money. And they seemed like such a good board member. They were such an upstanding member. And, oh, guess what? To make matters worse, we had no employee dishonesty coverage. So now what do we do? How do we get that money back? And you might be stuck with trying to get that person to pay restitution over years and years to get that money back. And if it's, if it's 10 grand, that's one thing. What if it's 200 grand? So um, you got to have that coverage. Um, and uh, I'd say you guys would probably agree that that's a, that's a must, right guys? Yeah, definitely want to have a, a crime policy in force for theft and uh, embezzlement or, or forgery and alteration or computer fraud, which I'll get back to in a second. Um, now, generally the crime policy will be a first party coverage where it will protect the association if the volunteers, you can add board members in there and you can even add uh, property managers, managers in there stealing from the association. Uh, I would also recommend the property managers getting a third party crime policy, which would cover them if they're accused of stealing from uh, a condo association, since it's not a first party uh, claim where if there's employees stealing from themselves or the, the property manager's company, it's a third party coverage to cover uh, that company, if some a third party uh, accused them of stealing, stealing uh, their funds or, or uh, forging or altering. Um, but going back to the uh, computer fraud, I'd like to also mention cyber liability, which we've seen a lot of claims from lately. Uh, there's different, um, many different coverages under a cyber program. A lot of the policies for condo associations will throw in a minimal amount of coverage but we recommend getting a monoline policy, which would be much more broad. And uh, can, then you can include things such as uh, social engineering, um, extortion, uh, also privacy, security, and, and many more coverages that we can design a program for. Um, question we have uh, in the chat is how much coverage is necessary for employee dishonesty? What is recommended? Um, Tough question. Um, Go ahead. We, you never know how much is enough till there's a claim. Uh, we would probably look at the, the at least a hundred thousand or more at a, as minimum. Um, we can design a program that it can maybe include the fidelity coverage, the the, the crime, also uh, directors and officers liability. It's a, it would be a management liability policy where you can include that and even. Uh, possibly some cyber in there and employment practices liability. So I, I always like to get many options for the associations and let them choose what they're comfortable with and look at the pricing difference too. It's not going to be a huge difference between 100,000 and 500,000, honestly. I just, I want to reiterate, that's such a great point that you just made a few minutes ago that, you know, for the fidelity, for the crime, that you need to have both covered. You get the property manager has to be covered and then the board needs to be covered, right? Because there's different types of claims, first party versus third party, right? Yes. Do you agree with that? I mean, it's just, it's just such a, you know, important thing because a lot of associations are boards. They don't know that. They're like, well, if they have the coverage that we don't need it, right? And vice versa, maybe. Yeah. Exactly. Definitely as a property manager too, they're, they're most likely not just managing the one property. So, they should have one to protect themselves in case any of the associations accuse them of uh, theft or, or uh, forging any type of documents. Yeah, and then and the last thing I would add on the amount of the coverage, there are, there are some mortgage financing requirements, you know, like for FHA mortgages and, and uh, Fannie and Freddie, I believe they like to see three months worth of assessments plus whatever you have in reserves as the amount of coverage that you carry for uh, crime or employee dishonesty. Um, so that's something to also keep in mind. It might be a mortgage financing concern. Next slide, please. So this is, I think, what Scott, what I think you were just starting to talk about. And if you could maybe explain these types of, you know, newer coverages for our audience. For sure. Yeah, these are, this, I guess, somewhat newer in the past decade or so, but we've seen a lot more claims recently. And it's not just the, the big companies that are getting hit with the cyber uh, crime. Uh, cyber liabil liability, as you can see, is designed to provide protection for uh, cyber-related exposures. It's not just cyber either. It could be data breach, it could be a paper file. Um, so don't just think of it as something over the internet, but it does 
uh, cover that, including unauthorized access, privacy breach, theft of digital assets, extortion, and, and human error is one of the, the, the big um, uh, examples of, of where we're seeing a lot of, of claims come from. Um, more claims are coming out of social engineering, which is if you willingly and pretty much get tricked to transfer money to somebody else, and once you hit that button, it's gone. If you don't have coverage uh, for that, you're out that, that those assets. You can either add that to a crime policy, but we typically like to include it in a cyber policy. Another example of claims that we've been seeing is extortion, where the hackers will get in and lock system up, systems up and contact the company and tell them to wire them twenty-five, fifty thousand uh, dollars then they'll let they'll they'll allow them to get back into their system. And we see that a lot too. So these are types of coverages we include in a model alliance cyber liability program. You're not necessarily going to see them in something that's added to a business owner's policy or even a package. Uh, but so we we deal with the top notch cyber uh, carriers that can include all this coverage. So for associations, for like a board, um, would you recommend that they get a separate policy? Like, uh, I mean, it, it might not, it might be included in another policy you said, but you'd recommend getting a separate endorsement or a separate coverage for that? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Even if they don't decide to go with it, it's, it's good to look into to get the option. Uh, as I mentioned, sometimes there's some coverage thrown on the package or business owner's policy to help them out a little bit, but it's not going to be as broad as the model line cyber liability program. And honestly, it's, it's not going to cost that much. It all depends on, on annual revenue and the type of operations. So a uh, condo association uh, premium wouldn't be too high for, for cyber liability. Yeah, this is another one of those things that it's definitely happening out there. Um, and it's definitely happening to associations and their property managers. Um, I've heard stories about it. And it's the same thing where they're trying to um, trick you into conveying money. You know, you could very easily imagine somebody impersonating you via email and saying, wire some money here. Um, that's what happens. And um, I think it's very important to look at um, in this day and age. Yeah, I'd also like to add the property managers should really have this as well. It's either, they, they might even have a bigger exposure. Yep. Okay, next slide. Workers' compensation. This is the age old question. We don't have any employees. So, as an association, we don't need workers' compensation, right? Well, and at this point, I'm going to launch a poll. Um, answer at your leisure. Um, I'll keep it open for like the next 10 minutes or so. Does your association carry workers' compensation insurance? Thank you, Melissa, for that um, poll. So if you go, attendees can go ahead and answer that. Uh, while we talk about workers' comp, um, how long does it take to get the answer, Melissa? <laughs> Should I go on or? Go well, ahead and go on. Okay. So the answer is we would recommend you still need workers' comp and I think Scott, and Josh agree with that. Um, it's yeah, 100%. yeah, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, hundred percent. Even if you have all volunteers, it's kind of like a safety net. Uh, I'd imagine any type of association or property manager is going to hire some a contractor either to come in and do some work on premises or the maintenance of, of the the grounds. And even if that, you should be also rec uh, requiring certificates of insurance showing they have general liability and naming the association and the property management company as an additional insured. We should also require workers' compensation in there, even if they provide that. That that that, that document's really only good for one day, and also if that contractor happens to hire out some labor, and they don't have workers' compensation but get injured while performing maintenance at your location, they could come back and, and uh, sue you for that or claim it on a workers' compensation policy. So it's more of a safety net. Uh, we re we recommend all companies that are hiring contractors or any type of work at their premises to have a subcontractor agreement, which we can help with. And also, uh, as I mentioned, have those certificates of insurance on hand before work starts. Yeah, and you know, this comes into play with, with boards where they wanna have, you know, somebody who lives there, you know, cut the bushes or, oh, there's a tree that needs to be cut down. 
let's go have them cut that tree down, that, you know, 200 foot tree. And that actually happened. <laughs> um, you know, that's not smart um, from my perspective. I mean, just my, my thought is just stay away from that. Don't have people who live there be doing the work. That's not their job. Um, you know, and some things might not have much risk. Um, but it's just not a good practice, I don't think. I mean, hire the professionals, hire the people that are insured and bonded to do your work on common elements. Because if you don't, and that person gets injured, they're going to sue you. I mean, if they don't get workers' comp from you or from somebody, they're going to sue for, for under liability or whatever. So you're going to get sued. Yeah. So, you know, just because you're not paying them, I don't think gets you out from being sued. Um, so you might as well have that coverage just to make sure, right? Yeah, I agree. And, and if, if you were, if you want, you're concerned about volunteers getting injured, you can always get what's called an accident and health policy to cover volunteers that are, that are, that are doing work for their, uh, organization, whether it's, uh, labor work, as Greg mentioned, or even just, uh, it, it could be clerical work for that matter. Um, and if they're volunteers, they wouldn't be added onto the workers' compensation policy because that's rated on payroll. Uh, I know there's, a question about a volunteer endorsement, but it's not designed for that type of situation. It's more for actual employees that are exempt, such as um, uh, executives or something of that nature, or somebody for somebody that might travel overseas and they want to make sure they have a coverage. So that's a, that's what the endorsement's for on the workers' compensation policy. But in order to have coverage for the the volunteers, you'd, you'd want to get an accident and health policy. So a special type of policy to cover that scenario. Specifically. Exactly. It's, it's, it's for volunteers specifically, and it's very inexpensive. But again, don't do those things without having the insurance, right? Make, Correct. Either way, you got to have the insurance. So um, I know there's, there's also an exemption for uh, sole proprietors, I guess, don't have to cover the carry their own workers comp, right? No, they do not. They can, if, if they're hired, uh, they can, complete what's called an independent contractor statement. If they're sole proprietors, that's all you need. And um, if they're an LLC corporation or partnership, you, you want to get one of those completed as well, plus get it what's called a BWC 337 form. Now the contractor would have to get that from the state of Michigan, which would clarify and, and uh, show that they're actually a true independent contractor, not an employee of the company. Right, because if they don't get the actual form, if they're not legit, and they're saying they don't need the coverage because they're an independent contractor, and you take their word for it, and they end up being not exempt, then again, there might be a lack of coverage and a problem, right? Correct. Okay. Um, so I think that covers workers' comp. Um, let's move on to the next slide, please. And the results of our poll is that 70% of you have workers' comp insurance insurance 30% of you do not so pretty uh, pretty smart group there. Um, co-owner insurance requirements so so far we've been talking a lot about the association level insurance um, let's talk a little bit about what owners and co-owners should have at the individual level um, you know this is a call what they call it, HO6 policy in the condo scenario you're going to cover personal property um, you're going to cover your upgrades, uh, improvements, betterments, and uh, liability for limited common elements. Um, and Josh, this is kind of your uh, area of expertise. If you want to maybe uh, speak a little bit about the co-owner coverages. Absolutely. So <clears throat> the biggest thing is um, making sure, obviously, the interior condo is covered. Um, and then obviously checking with your bylaws to see what is required. Um, from what I found, a condo policy, so a HO6 for an individual inexpensive. So we always like to err on the side of, you know, more than enough coverage and less. Um, they're going to refer to the language is called building property protection. So it's similar to like the dwelling coverage on a home, right? So all the interior, if they're responsible. Um, Typically what I've found is if there's a lien or a lien holder, you have a mortgage on the condo, it's gonna be required that they have 20% for building property. That's typically pretty low. So, I mean, I'll ask the, the owner individually, like what do you have going on in your condo? Have you had custom upgrades, counters? Um, what do we need to insure? 
And then um, also, you know, a, a super important coverage that um, that we like to offer is the, you can see on the slide is the water sump pump backup rider. So that's if a toilet's backing up or I mean, in cases that the condo, you know, has um, a sump pump backs up, we found that a lot of claims fall under that category as well as there's a loss assessment rider. So that covers more of the, you know, e e the common grounds of the um, association. If someone gets hurt and then the association account is depleted, then the owner has to pitch in. So we always try to max out that as well. Um, and then the last thing here I'm seeing is um, also, if it's a co-owner co and the condo is rented out, requiring that the renter have renter's insurance to cover their own um, personal property. Yeah, and that's an important point on the rentals is, you know, you can't get an HO6 policy if the unit is rented. Uh, you gotta get something comparable, is that correct? Correct, absolutely, yep. You can't have your unit not be insured by the co-owner just because there's a renter in there, right? So the unit should still be insured, but the renter should also have their renter renter's coverage, I would think. For their personal belongings, absolutely. We, um, I always like to ask a question because you know, it's kind of the last thing someone will think about, but if someone's renting it out, they have to cover their own belongings right. at a loss. Right. So. So I guess at the end of the day, I think what we're saying, we're all saying is as an individual, talk to your insurance agent, tell them what you have, tell them what the situation is, what you're doing with your unit, what's in your unit, who else is in your unit, um, to make sure you have the right coverage because um, there could be a lot of variability, it uh, looks like, and you want to make sure. I think that's a great suggestion to have the water sump pump backup rider. Um, you know, that's certainly uh, a frequent occurrence in condos with drain backups and things like that. And a loss assessment, I think, is also very important. Make sure you have coverage for loss assessment and, or if the association is going to assess deductibles to you. Uh, again, you know, make sure you have that coverage so that you're not stuck with something that the association is going to try to assess you or assess every, you know, co-owner for as a result of a loss. Um, let's move on to next slide, please. All right, so again, going back to COVID-19, what can we expect from our insurance companies as to how they're gonna handle uh, losses that might relate to COVID? Well, it's, it's not really good news across the board for the associations. Um, they are excluding, um, well, under general liability or property coverage, either one, there's gonna be a lot of exclusions. I've looked at policies myself and I'm sure Josh and Scott can confirm. You're gonna have these exclusions for like viruses or the ones I've seen use the word biological hazard. Um, you know, specific exclusions that are just gonna negate any coverage you might have for a claim that somebody brings against the board or the association under liability or under you know, property coverage. I mean, I guess it's possible you might not have an exclusion um, I've heard occasionally of a policy not having them, but the rule seems to be that, in my experience, that most of the time you're going to have exclusion. So don't expect uh, your insurance company is going to step in and protect you under property or under liability or under DNO, as we already said. So what does that mean? It means you got to be really careful when you make decisions as a board as to how you're managing the affairs of the association, because if you're pointing out to a, a situation that in, involves increased risk because of COVID, that's probably an uninsured risk, okay? So you better have $500,000 or $200,000 in your bank account to self-insure for that possible lawsuit. And again, it's not just about damages. You know, maybe they can't prove that they caught it at the pool, you know, but they might try to sue, sue you for it. Um, and the lawsuit in and of itself would be, you know, devastating to many, most associations who don't have that kind of money sitting around. So you got to really think about the lack of insurance coverage for most of these types of losses. Yeah, correct. The, the, the standard ISO uh, form for general liability excludes bacteria, viruses, communicable, communicable diseases. Uh, so what we've seen so far is that, 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 that on the general liability and property uh, coverage is not responding for say on the property side of it is business income loss because there has to be a direct physical damage and alteration to a property uh, for that coverage to be triggered. And, and 
COVID-19 at this point is not uh, the physical damage in the eyes of the insurance carrier. Um, but uh, we, we, we've also talked about how on the general liability, it's, it's gonna be hard to prove exactly where the, uh, if somebody did uh, contract COVID-19, where they actually got it at. It, so it's, it's gonna be hard to prove. It's, it's gonna be most likely excluded from the policy uh, as far as damages go, but that you should have uh, coverage in place to defend you anyway. We have a question, Melissa, is that? Yep, before we go to the next slide, um, Josh, if there's a water leak from an upper unit that damages a lower unit, will an upper unit's HO6 policy cover that damage? Typically it will. I mean, it can get kind of tricky um, in a case like that. So that's why I always err on the side of having that water backup rider on your policy. Um, it really will go down to, you know, the association that they're in and then unfortunately the carrier that they, that they have. Um, so I would, I would just err on the side of having the rider, which is minimal in cost to protect you no matter what way it goes. Um, I don't have like an indefinite yes, but I would, I would err on the side it would, but I mean, just add that rider if you don't have it and advise people that you know to have it on there would be my recommendation. And if not, I, I could see the, the, the carrier for the bottom unit subrogating uh, against the carrier right. for the, the unit above as well. Yeah. Yeah, my experience on that would be, you know, usually you end up with a lot of different insurance companies to get mixing together and kind of trying to settle up. And Pointing one, fingers. Yeah. So like mm -hmm. you'll have the association say, I'll cover, we'll cover this and then you cover that. And usually they kind of settle it uh, amicably with hopefully there'll be enough insurance money between all three units uh, to go around. Occasionally it ends up in litigation if there isn't. You know, that's usually when you have litigation is somebody did not have any insurance. Okay. So you know, upper, if the upper unit owner, you know, their leak causes it and they don't have any insurance, you know, then they're going to be sued, you know, are probably going to be sued by the co-owner for whatever they were out of pocket, you know, the downstairs co-owner or the association. If the association had any out of pocket, they're going to try to sue for their deductible. So um, probably end up in litigation if there's insufficient insurance, which again, it usually just spends a lot of time and money and you would just would have been better off in the first place to have really good insurance. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. 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 All right, uh, we're getting towards the end here. We got about 10 more minutes, I think, but let's talk a little bit about uh, disaster planning. Um, I don't want to get into this in depth today because my partner, Ed Zelmanski, covered this uh, with a very in depth uh, BEAT seminar last month. Um, and so it's the name of the seminar was Managing the Unexpected How to Handle Water, Fire, and Mold Losses. Uh, this was a joint seminar he did with Concraft. So experts, uh, professionals in the field of you know, remediation after losses, fire, uh, fires, you know, floods, mold. So if you go to our YouTube channel, our firm's YouTube channel, we have uh, several old uh, BEAT seminars on there. And we're going to be posting this one as well as soon as it's uh, edited. Uh, but our name of our YouTube channel is ZDF Condo and HOA Attorneys. That's on YouTube. Um, also, you could type in hash brown condo, or not hash brown. I saw it on a TV show and now it's stuck in my head. Not Ash Brown, hashtag, <laughs> hashtag condo fire. And that will take you uh, to, the, to the video. Not Ash Brown, hashtag. Uh, it'll take you right to our video and you'll find all our other videos as well on the channel. Um, and I'm going to launch another poll that is, do you have a disaster or a pandemic plan? So uh, pandemic planning, we're going to close out today, just talk a little bit about pandemic planning. Maybe uh, Scott and Josh, if you could just kind of describe this kind of cutting edge uh, program that you guys are talking about and offering. Yeah, this, this is a proprietary program. Unfortunately, we had to put one together for the current situation. 
Um, it, as, you, as you can see here, the steps, it just kind of outlines the, policy, or the procedures for responding quickly um, in the event of a pandemic. You, you want to have make sure you have backup strategies uh, within the organization. It could be uh, management, IT, what to do with, on your website. Uh, it's just something, unfortunately, it, it's similar to a disaster planning, but geared to, toward uh, a specific uh, pandemic. So. Uh, again, like you said, Greg, thanks. It's, it's kind of more cutting edge. Uh, nobody else is really doing this. So it's, it's uh, really customized for each organization that we work with because nobody really is the same and same size. And, and even though the operations might be the same, we just customize it for each company. Yeah, and I, you know, planning ahead with, with your insurance company and with your board and your property manager, I think is huge. You know, have that plan in place the last thing you want to be doing with a loss is, you know, reacting uh, while there's, you know, a panic going on and, and you got to get in there and, and figure out what you're going to do with this unit. So I totally agree to coordinate this with your property manager, um, have some kind of a plan for, for any kind of loss, whether it's a flood or a fire or, or the pandemic and um, come up with a plan, put it in writing and have it available. Um, next slide, please. And if you could just close it out for us, uh, Scott, on um, the rest of these details on your pandemic planning that you offer. Yep, thanks. And as you can see there, yeah, exactly. You want to develop the plan. You want to be proactive. Obviously, it's it's not the right time to do it after something happens, just like a disaster plan. Uh, you want to make sure you develop it. Uh, it's structured and, and understood, and, and everybody knows what they need to do. Um, board members should all ensure that the, the property manager is, is, understands it as well and what their duties are when they go ahead and implement the plan and uh, ensure that the pandemic plan is operation or the pandemic operational policies adhered to within all planned activities. Uh, ensure that con contingency arrangements are cost-effective too. Um, it, it's generally, it's, it, there's a lot of detail in there, but it, it's usually cost-effective, just alerting everybody and, and, and making sure everybody's on the same page on what to do in the event of the pandemic. Um, Going down to another bullet point there, uh, the association should know what their duties and responsibilities are uh, when, when the time comes. So uh, again, it, it's it's customized depending on what type of industry, whether it's a manufacturer, contractor, uh, condo association. Um, you're going to want to make sure a uh, certain pandemic recovery plan is, is acceptable to the association members, uh, property management, key vendors, and others. So it's again, it's, it's proprietary, it's newer, it's, uh, it's something unfortunately that we're gonna have to uh, keep helping our clients with in the future. Yep, and if anybody has further questions on that, they could I'm sure contact you with, uh, with uh, we have email addresses on slide right. 24. So I'm sure they'd be happy to help, you, help anybody who has any questions. Um, poll results, nobody has a plan, <laughs> 100%. Yeah, I knew on the pandemic plan they wouldn't, um, but uh, yeah, we could also help with the disaster plans. I know, I know, Greg, you you guys have already started on, on helping out there, and you have that the, the YouTube video, which I'm going to take a look at as well. Yeah, I agree. It's just the broader topic of planning for losses. I think every association, certainly every condo association, uh, especially if it's an attached scenario, um, should have um, a plan like that. Um, you know, you have things that affect multiple units pretty frequently, uh, floods, fires. I've seen, you know, fires can be really devastating uh, if you have one of those and you've got attached units could affect several units. So yeah. I think it's good, really a, a good idea to consider with, to plan, even if it's just planning for a fire, how to handle it, um, you know, proactively. Agreed. Um, okay, so I think that's it for pandemic planning and uh, most of our seminar today. Does anybody else have any other questions for our panel? Now's the time to ask. Anybody else has anything? Um, Melissa has provided the PowerPoint. So if anybody wants a copy of that, they can uh, email and ask for that. We'll be happy to provide it, no cost. Um, and as I said, this video will be available both on our Facebook page as well as on YouTube. So uh, if you want to watch it, you can watch it at your convenience, watch it on your big screen TV at home, 
you know, and uh, enjoy the, uh, the content. Um, what do we got coming up next month, Alyssa? Next month, we have Tracy Danner Bond, who will present on October 14th, 2020, amending your condominium documents, preparing for success. Okay. So if you would like information on that, um, feel free to email myself or Stacia and we can get that to you. Yep, that's going to be uh, October 14th. Um, Tracy Dannerbon and Richard Wagner uh, both have a lot of experience with document amendments. I believe they're going to be talking about condos and HOAs. Um, so if you're in one of those, uh, be sure to tune in and check out uh, how to amend your documents. Uh, I think that's it. I don't see any other questions. Anybody have anything else? I think we're ready to wrap it up. And I will stay online um, in the Zoom call for a little while, probably for an extra five, 10 minutes. Um, if you want to email me your email addresses or chat me your email addresses. Well, I just want to thank everybody for coming today uh, to Beat Bites, and we'll do it again every month. And thank you very much, Scott and Josh, for, for participating today. Your input was invaluable. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. You too. Thank you.